evening. My name is Sarah Watson, and we are so thrilled that you have joined us tonight. Our show tonight is Lincoln and Mormon Country, and this is a part of our continuing series, Looking for Lincoln Conversations. Tonight, we're going to learn more about Abraham Lincoln's connection to Mormon Country. Our speaker tonight is Brian Andresen. He's a historian at the LDS Church History Museum in Salt Lake City and the author of Looking for Lincoln in Illinois, Lincoln Springfield, and Looking for Lincoln in Illinois, Lincoln and Mormon Country. He was formerly the research historian at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum and was on the ground floor of helping create the Looking for Lincoln Heritage Coalition. Brian, we're thrilled to have you back with us. Um, for more information about Looking for Lincoln Conversations, visit the Looking for Lincoln Facebook page. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Brian Andresen. Well, Sarah and Heather, thank you so much for the invitation uh, to come back and talk about Lincoln again. I, I don't get to think about Lincoln and his world as much as I, I'd like to and used to. So this is really a lot of fun for me tonight. I, I appreciate it. Well, most people make little of any connection between Abraham Lincoln's history and the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or the Mormons, as they are more commonly called. To the extent, if any, that people encounter the Latter-day Saints in the Lincoln story, it is usually during the Civil War when Lincoln had to decide how to deal with Brigham Young and his people in the territory of Utah that straddled supply and communication lines between the East and West coasts. A few years earlier, President James Buchanan had sent the U.S. Army to Utah to put down a supposed Mormon rebellion against the United States. That whole episode had ended up a fiasco and a real embarrassment for the Buchanan administration. But still, Protestant church groups and Protestant women's rights reformers kept constant pressure on the young Republican Party, pushing politicians to take decisive action against polygamy and against the Latter-day Saint dominance in Utah politics and society. So Lincoln was obliged to sign his party's anti-polygamy bill, the, the Moral Anti-Bigamy Act, when Congress passed it in the middle of the war. But he didn't really enforce it. And he famously shared with a church envoy from Utah a boyhood story that illustrated his attitude toward the Latter-day Saints. Lincoln reportedly said, when I was a boy on the farm in Illinois, there was a great deal of timber on the farm, which we had to clear away. Occasionally, we would come to a big log which had fallen down. It was too hard to split, too wet to burn, and too heavy to move, so we plowed around it. Uh, you go back and tell Brigham Young that if he will let me alone, I will let him alone. So that's a nice Civil War story. But what do Lincoln and Latter-day Saint connections have to do with the Abraham Lincoln National Heritage Area in central Illinois? Why, for example, would Looking for Lincoln choose the topic of Lincoln and the Latter-day Saints as the subject for one of its books in the Looking for Lincoln in Illinois guidebook series published by Southern Illinois University Press? Well, some historical context might help us understand connections between Lincoln and the Latter-day Saints and why they have relevance to the National Heritage Area today. So let us begin. Lincoln and Joseph Smith, the founding prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, were about the same age. Smith was born in Vermont two days before Christmas in 1805. Lincoln was born 38 months later in Kentucky, two days before Valentine's Day in 1809. So Smith was a little more than three years older than Abraham Lincoln. To put it in terms more relatable to today, you know, Lincoln would have been a sophomore in high school when Joseph Smith was a senior. Now, of course, they didn't have high schools uh, back in those days. Uh, in his youth, Joseph Smith's family left New England and moved to Western New York, where they eventually lived on a frontier farm in the rural Rolling Hill country south of Palmyra. Abraham Lincoln's family, in his youth, left Kentucky and moved to southern Indiana, 
where they cleared fields in the wilderness just north of the Ohio River to live the life of upland southern subsistence farmers. In the spring of 1830, 24-year-old Joseph Smith published the Book of Mormon at Palmyra, New York, and he organized a church, originally just called the Church of Christ, with congregations in the Finger Lake region of New York and near the Susquehanna River along the Pennsylvania border. That same spring of 1830, out in the West, 21-year-old Abraham Lincoln had left Indiana with his father's family in late February and moved to Illinois. Barry helped his father establish the family's first homestead, clearing 15 acres of land and splitting rails for fences north of the Sangamon River near Harristown in central Illinois, just west of Decatur. At the end of the year, several Latter-day Saint missionaries traveled almost a thousand miles from western New York, all the way across Ohio. They went down the Ohio River, uh, then up the Mississippi to St. Louis, and then out to Missouri to the Indian lands to preach to American Indians. Now, this was during the presidency of Andrew Jackson and the forced removal of Indian tribes to territories bordering the furthest Western state at that time, Missouri. The newly published Book of Mormon had revealed that the native peoples of the Americas would play an important role in helping to build a community of righteous people, a land of Zion, in preparation for the millennial reign of Jesus Christ at his second coming. So devoted Latter-day Saints would cross and crisscross the country throughout the 1830s between their two major places of gathering, Kirtland, Ohio in the east, and Independence, Missouri in the west near the American Indian lands, often passing back and forth across Illinois. Joseph Smith himself crossed several times in the 1830s, going back and forth between Kirtland and places, several different places in Missouri. And, you know, one of the questions that people ask me all the time is whether Joseph Smith and Abraham Lincoln ever met. Well, from surviving records, it seems that at the times and places that Smith passed through Illinois in these years, Lincoln was always busy somewhere else. There was one trip, however, when Smith led an expedition across the center of what today is the Abraham Lincoln National Heritage Area. As the map shows with the green line, the main body of the expedition passed right by Decatur and Springfield and Jacksonville and right past where the Lincoln family had first homesteaded in Illinois, north of the Sanguine River, just west of Decatur. This expedition, which came to be known as Zion's Camp, was on its way to western Missouri, where they hoped to restore to their homes the saints who had been driven away the previous winter by armed mobs that were intent on ridding their county of the Mormons. The expedition camped very near Lincoln's fam uh, the Lincoln family old homestead, um, and even they even had a sham battle there as a diversion from the hardships of their march. Of course, at this time, you know, Lincoln was living in New Salem and was campaigning for his second try to be elected to the state legislature. And his father's family had moved to southeast, the, down uh, southeast of here to, to Coles County. Otherwise, they, if they had still lived there, they probably would have encountered members of Smith's expedition who were camping near where their home used to be. Well, to complete the story, when Zion's camp got out to western Missouri, Missouri's governor refused to assist them in reclaiming their Jackson County lands. So the saints disbanded and Joseph Smith returned to Ohio. And though the expedition failed in, in its original purpose, it proved to be an invaluable learning experience for future church leaders. Well, the saints were never destined to build a Zion city in Missouri. In the autumn of 1838, state militias besieged their city of far west, arrested and imprisoned Joseph Smith and 60 other church leaders, and drove the rest of the saints out of Missouri in the wintertime under an extermination order issued by Missouri Governor Lilburn Boggs. The saints crossed back across the Mississippi River, most of them in the area of Quincy, and gathered there and around Adams County throughout the winter of 1839. Joseph Smith was allowed to escape by embarrassed Missouri legal officials in April, 
And not long after, Smith approved the purchase of lands along the Mississippi River in Hancock County at Commerce, Illinois, which he renamed Nauvoo. And it became the new gathering place for Latter-day Saints, another attempt to build a Zion city. Now, at the same time he was starting Nauvoo, Joseph Smith sent the church's apostles to England on missions. These included Brigham Young and Heber Kimball. These two men were still suffering the effects of fevers that they had caught from the swampy lands in Nauvoo before they'd been properly drained. So they had to stop in Springfield for several days in early October 1839 to regain their strength before they went on to England. Well, while they lingered there, Illinois' Whig political party was having its first ever statewide political convention. And the town was bursting with Whig politicians from all over the state. And while Young and Kimball languished in their sick beds, the rising young Whig politician, Abraham Lincoln, was just a few blocks away, busily politicking for presidential candidate William Henry Harrison. Convention delegates in Springfield chose Lincoln to be one of Illinois' five Whig electors for the nation's electoral college. Ironically, the next year in the presidential election, the Saints in Nauvoo voted overwhelmingly for Harrison, but they crossed off the bottom name on the Whig ballot, which happened to be Abraham Lincoln, and they wrote in the name of a Democrat from Quincy as a way to show Democrats that they appreciated the help that they had received from them as well as from the Whigs when they had arrived as refugees the year before. Well, Lincoln did not meet Brigham Young or Heber Kimball when they were in town in October of 1839. And it appears that Lincoln and Brigham Young never did meet in person. A month later, in November of 1839, Joseph Smith passed through Springfield on his way to Washington, D.C. He was seeking relief from Congress and President Martin Van Buren for all the property that the Saints had lost when they were expelled from Missouri. He stayed over four nights in Springfield visiting church members in the area. And Lincoln's roommate and close friend, Joshua Speed, met Smith. We know this because of a subsequent letter that Lincoln wrote to his old law partner, John Todd Stewart, who was in Washington serving as a congressman at the time. Lincoln wrote, Joshua Speed says he wrote you what Joe Smith said about you as he passed here. We will procure the names of some of his people here and send them to you before long. Well, Speed was Lincoln's closest friend in Springfield. If Joshua Speed talked to Joseph Smith, I think it's highly likely that Abraham Lincoln did too, but there's nothing definitive to prove it. We do know that a year later, in December of 1840, Lincoln, as a member of the Illinois House of Representatives, voted in favor of a city charter for Nauvoo. We know this because of a letter that John C. Bennett wrote to Joseph Smith back at Nauvoo. Bennett was the lobbyist for the Saints in Springfield, and he oversaw the passage of the Nauvoo Charter through the legislature. After it passed, Bennett wrote back to Nauvoo, here, I should not forget to mention that Lincoln, whose name we erased from the electoral ticket in November, had the magnanimity to vote for our act and came forward after the final vote to the bar of the house and cordially congratulated me on its passage. Well, at the time that the charter passed, it was not controversial, but it later became so. And its passage by the legislature was heavily derided by Joseph Smith's enemies. Ironically, Bennett later became one of those enemies. Joseph Smith entered Springfield for the last time on December 30th, 1842. The previous May, someone had attempted to assassinate former Missouri Governor Boggs at his home in Independence, Missouri. Boggs, remember, had issued the infamous Mormon extermination order. So he assumed that Joseph Smith was behind his attempted murder. Writs were issued. Boggs successor in the Missouri governor's chair requested Smith's extradition for trial back to Missouri. On the advice of legal counsel, Smith surrendered himself to authorities in Springfield 
and obtained a writ of habeas corpus to be heard before the federal district judge, Nathaniel Pope. The hearing was held in the federal courtroom on the second floor of the Tinsley building across the street from the Capitol. Interest in seeing the Mormon prophet in person was intense. Everybody who was anybody attended one of the hearing sessions, including many ladies of high standing, which was somewhat unusual for courts uh, proceedings in those days. Among those was Mary Lincoln, who at the time was a young bride of two months and two months pregnant. Joseph Smith's attorney, Justin Butterfield, began the hearing by addressing the court with these words. May it please the court. I appear before you today under circumstances most novel and peculiar. I am to address the Pope, bowing to the judge, surrounded by angels, bowing still lower to the ladies, in the presence of the holy apostles, in the behalf of the prophet of the Lord. Well, the hearing lasted for several days, and the result was that Judge Pope quashed the writ of extradition and set Joseph Smith free. No one was surprised. So Mary Lincoln apparently attended Joseph Smith's federal court hearing. Did Abraham Lincoln? Records indicate that for much of that week, Lincoln was involved in the state house, serving as a defense attorney for Illinois Supreme Court Justice Thomas C. Brown, who was in, being investigated for impeachment, for removal from the court. Would it have been possible for Lincoln, who was busy in Judge Brown's hearing, in the Illinois House of Representatives to have also slipped across the square to the Tinsley building to see any part of Joseph Smith's hearing in the federal court? A comparison of Brown's removal hearing schedule and Smith's federal court hearing schedule, refer, uh, it shows that there were a few times that it might have been possible for Lincoln to maybe have run over to the Smith hearing, but we'll probably never know for sure if he actually did. It was uh, trying to answer this question that led me to research in detail uh, Judge Brown's removal hearing, the impeachment hearing there, and, and Lincoln's role in it, an event that Lincoln biographers have occasionally mentioned, but nobody had ever really specifically studied or analyzed. My research on this episode resulted in my writing a study, Defending Judge Brown, a case study in the legal, legislative, and political workings of Abraham Lincoln's Illinois. And John Lupton published it under the auspices of the Illinois Supreme Court Historic Preservation Commission about eight years ago. So writing this book was one of the most intriguing and satisfying projects that I've ever undertaken as a historian. And it all started because people kept asking me if Abraham Lincoln had ever attended Joseph Smith's extradition hearing. Well, during the week of the trial, a fancy gala was held at on New Year's Eve at Springfield's fanciest hotel, the American House. Newly elected U.S. Senator Sidney Breeze, who had just defeated Stephen Douglas for the seat uh, for, for that seat in Congress, threw a great big party. And according to Lincoln historian Harry Pratt, Joseph Smith attended the party. But Pratt cited no evidence for this. The party is described in newspaper reports, but there's no mention of Smith being there, and it's not mentioned in any Mormon sources either. But this did not stop the novelist Irving Stone from imagining a remarkable scene in his historical romance, Love is Eternal, about the courtship and marriage of Abraham and Mary Lincoln. He placed the Lincolns at the New Year's Eve party at the American House, and in the scene as depicted in the novel, Joseph enters the room and creates an immediate sensation. Mary makes her way over to him and is introduced. Then, Mary found herself gazing into a pair of the most magnetic blue eyes she had ever encountered. May I bid you welcome to Springfield, Mr. Smith, she said. Most of us feel you are being persecuted. Thank you, Mrs. Lincoln, the prophet replied, his voice a powerful throbbing organ. He flashed her a taunting smile. Mrs. Lincoln, if you ever become disillusioned with your chosen church, come to Nauvoo and let me reveal the true religion to you. Thank you, she replied with a full curtsy. It's always gratifying to be wanted. Well, 
did the Lincolns really meet Joseph Smith at the Sydney Breeze Levee in the American House on New Year's Eve night in 1842? There appears to be no evidence to substantiate a meeting, but who can fault a novelist for inventing such a, such a great scene? So did Abraham Lincoln meet and talk with Joseph Smith at springtime uh, at Springfield at any time uh, during that long first week in January of 1843? While there were several instances where they might have, it's plausible, we simply don't know for certain. But Springfield in the winter of 1842-43 was probably the last time when the two could have met because Smith never returned to Sangamon County after his federal court hearing, and there's no record that Lincoln ever went to Nauvoo. On this map, the red line shows the route that Joseph Smith took between Nauvoo and Springfield, which goes right through the western section of the Lincoln National Heritage Area today. And Lincoln would have been familiar with these routes as well. For even though Lincoln apparently had never visited Nauvoo, he did travel to Carthage and Hancock County on a couple of occasions. His visits to Hancock County were infrequent in part because Lincoln's legal and political activities took place mostly in the central and eastern part of the state. <clears throat> in the counties of his court circuit district, the 8th Judicial Circuit, outlined in black there, and in his congressional district, which is in yellow. While Stephen Douglas's activities kept him mostly in the central and western part of the state. There he was elected to Congress in a far western district outlined there in black and where he served as a judge of the 5th Judicial District in yellow that included Hancock County. So as a general rule, people in the western counties knew Douglas a lot better than they knew Lincoln. The earliest documented instance of Lincoln being in Hancock County was when he attended the circuit court in Carthage to defend a man accused of murder. Now, he didn't usually attend Hancock County Circuit Court, but the murder case, which had started at the circuit court in Beardstown in Cass County, had a change of venue to Carthage. And Lincoln, who had been appointed by the court to act as counsel for the defendant, had to travel the 115 miles to Carthage to fill his assignment. Now this was in April of 1839, and the case was one of the very first cases argued in the new Hancock County Courthouse. There would not be another murder case tried there for six more years when in 1845, the accused killers of Joseph Smith were tried and acquitted there. Of course, Lincoln was not involved in that case. Uh, of the 26 murder cases in which Lincoln represented the defendant, this was the only case that Lincoln lost, the only client that got to, that went to the gallows. At the time of the trial, the Latter-day Saints were on the verge of picking Nauvoo as their new gathering place, but they hadn't really started to arrive yet, so there weren't any Mormons involved in the trial. But one of the jurors who voted to hang Lincoln's client was an early settler in the Nauvoo area, a man named Daniel Wells. Wells was a Whig, like Lincoln, and it's he who sold the Latter-day Saints their land for, for the temple there in Nauvoo. Well, after Joseph Smith was killed and when the Saints were forced at gunpoint to leave Illinois in 1846, Wells decided to join them and converted and made the journey to Utah, where he eventually became a militia general and a counselor to church president Brigham Young. There is no documented instance of Lincoln going back to Hancock County until the great Lincoln-Douglas senatorial campaign in 1858. Of course, by then, almost all Latter-day Saints were long gone, Joseph Smith having been killed at Carthage in 1844 and Brigham Young having left for the West with the majority of the Saints in 1846. The 1858 campaign is famous for the Lincoln-Douglas debates the seven face-to-face -face, face -face confrontations that are a cornerstone in American political history. Well, none of the seven debates was held in Hancock County, 
But Lincoln gave four formal speeches there. That's more than any other county during the Senate contest. And Stephen Douglas spoke in Hancock County three times, more than any other county except Madison County, where he also spoke three times. Well, this map shows everywhere that the candidates traveled in 1858. Lincoln in the red, Douglas in the blue. And you can see that West Central Illinois was the most hotly contested area in the entire state. Who won in Western Illinois? It was very close, but Douglas won most Western counties, including Hancock County. Uh, as a side note, um, Lincoln lost Hancock in both 1860 and 1864 when he was running for president. Although he won the presidency twice, he just couldn't win in Hancock County. At the time of the 1858 campaign, Joseph Smith's oldest son, 22-year-old Joseph Smith III, was still living at Nauvoo with his mother, who had not followed Brigham Young West. Joseph III favored Douglas for the Senate because Douglas had befriended his father back in the 1840s. So he attended the Douglas rally at Carthage but he was disappointed. It was clear that Douglas was intoxicated and local democratic leaders had to make him sit down early to stop the embarrassment. Well, a few days later, young Joseph returned to Carthage to hear Lincoln. Years later, Joseph remembered, Lincoln looked so inferior to what I had in mind. His appearance was anything but prepossessing or reassuring. His eyes were dull, his manner awkward, his voice sharp. I felt very sorry for him. Well, Lincoln was speaking from a platform um, over which a canopy of leafy branches had been erected to protect him from the sun. But when Lincoln squared his shoulders and straightened up, his head hit the branches and a humorous expression crossed his face and turning his head slightly to one side with a sudden movement, he thrust it upward and entirely threw the Bowery business above him. And there he stood towering like some queer creature whose head was detached from its body. Well, the crowd roared with approval and Lincoln went on to spellbind his audience. And by the time the speech was over, young Joseph was completely and altogether a Lincoln man. Well, Lincoln did not leave behind much in terms of letters or stories about Latter-day Saints, but various saints left behind Lincoln stories. Our time's getting to a close here, but let me share just two such stories. Remember Daniel Wells, the juror who voted to hang Lincoln's client and later converted to the saints? In later life, Wells enjoyed sharing his own personal version of a common Lincoln story. Wellson's version went like this. The first time Lincoln met me, the tall lawyer exclaimed, prepare to die. I swore that if I ever met a man who was uglier than I, I would shoot him. To which Wells replied, shoot away. If I'm as ugly as you are, then I don't want to live. Well, over the many decades, uh, many people have remembered versions of this story involving different people at different places. Lincoln is known to have repeated jokes and stories, so it's possible that Wells was one of many who heard some version of this from Lincoln and appropriated it for himself. A different story was told by Jonathan Browning, who was a gunsmith living in Quincy, Illinois, when the Saints sought refuge there from the Missouri extra, uh, extermination order. Brown and Browning befriended the Mormons, and he read the Book of Mormon and converted to their faith and moved to Nauvoo, and later followed Brigham Young to Utah, where Browning's son, John M. Browning, founded the world-renowned Browning Gun Company. Well, when Jonathan Browning still lived in Quincy before the Saints arrived, his cousin, Orville Hickman Browning, reportedly introduced him to his legal and political associate, Abraham Lincoln. By the way, Orville Browning later defended Joseph Smith in a court hearing before Stephen Douglas, and then he also defended Joseph Smith's accused killers in, in court. So Browning was playing both sides of the fence. But gunsmith Browning 
and Lincoln shared frontier Southern backgrounds and were about the same age. And according to Browning, shared a penchant for homespun humor. Browning claimed that Lincoln visited his home in Quincy and the two started swapping stories. Lincoln laughed heartily on learning that the gunsmith had once traded a gun for a Bible. That's like turning swords into plowshares, Lincoln quipped in reference to Isaiah's biblical admonition. Browning then confessed that the traded gun had been defective, having a mainspring that was pretty weak. In mock indignation, Lincoln declared, you cheated in a trade for a Bible. Not exactly, Browning retorted. When I got home, I found about half the New Testament was missing. The convulsive laughter of the two men near shook the logs of the cabin. At least that's how Browning told the story to his family many years later, after Lincoln had become famous. Well, there's lots of other stories, but it's time to stop. Um, in summary, what did the Latter-day Saints think of Lincoln? During Joseph Smith's lifetime and during the Illinois years, Lincoln was not really widely known among the saints. No one had a clue that one day he would become president of the United States. His political party, the Whigs, was part of the anti-Mormon coalition, and many of Lincoln's political associates were active and vocal enemies of Joseph Smith and the church. Lincoln, though, was not a direct participant in anti-Mormon activities. But that wasn't sufficient for Brigham Young, who years later expressed re resentment that although Lincoln had not joined in persecuting the church, he had done nothing proactive to prevent such persecution either. During the Civil War, the saints in Utah recognized Lincoln's quiet moderating of the Republican Party's strong anti-Mormon efforts, and they especially appreciated his policy of letting them alone if they left him alone. Church members sincerely mourned his assassination. And as time passed, the saints as a people came to revere Lincoln as an instrument in God's hands for the furtherance of divine purposes without necessarily ascribing to Lincoln an understanding or consciousness of Latter-day Saint teachings or beliefs. And what did Lincoln think of the saints? Well, in general, there's very little about the saints in any of Lincoln's papers from the Illinois years. Throughout his life, he, he seemed to tolerate them, as he did Jews and Catholics, better than most of his associates in the Whig and then later the Republican Party. And he refrained as much as possible from dragging religious differences into politics. So perhaps now you have a little better feel for why Lincoln and the Mormons was chosen as a topic for looking, the Looking for Lincoln book series. And though Lincoln and the Latter-day Saints inhabited different political, social, and cultural circles, their stories intersected in many surprising ways. Their stories helped bring attention, especially to the Western parts of the National Heritage Area. And for tourists, including Latter-day Saints who come to Illinois primarily to visit historic sites around Nauvoo, the stories may help them see that connections between the early saints and Lincoln-related history are spread all across the heritage area and are not confined, not confined just to Nauvoo. So I have no qualms about putting in a shameless plug for the book uh, because all the sale proceeds go to looking for Lincoln for use in the National Heritage Area. There are 33 story topics in looking in Lincoln and Mormon country and an introductory essay on did Lincoln and Joseph Smith ever meet that provides historical context for stories that follow. So I invite you to go read the book. And with that, I'll try to stop sharing and uh, I'm done. Why, thank you, Brian. And um, this is now time, everyone. Um, to type your questions in the comments, and we will take as many as we have time allotted for. So thank you, Brian, for sharing. And to kick our questions off, I have one um, that has come up tonight. So I know several times you mentioned people kept asking you if Lincoln and Joseph Smith had ever met. But was that really what started you studying this whole idea, or... Was there something else that prompted you to kind of study the Lincoln and Mormon connection? 
Well, it, uh, it truly was, you know, in, in, in terms of uh, justifying spending time at work on this, it, it was it was people asking, asking that question. And also back in 2005, it was the sesquicentennial, no, it, it was the bicentennial of, of Joseph Smith's birth. And so there was, there was a lot of interest uh, about Joseph Smith nationally. And, you know, we, we thought that uh, we, should, we should try to capture some of this in, in Lincoln sites as well, because there were a lot of connections uh, between Mormon stories and, and Lincoln stories in Illinois. And so that, uh, you know, that all prompted me. But then also, I, I am a Latter-day Saint, and I have, I have ancestors who lived in Nauvoo. And so I had a personal interest, you know, in what, uh, what possible contacts and th things there may have been uh, between Lincoln's world and, and some of my ancestors who were in Western Illinois in the 1840s. Okay. Well, we have our first question. Um, the question is, did, didn't Lincoln check out the Book of Mormon from the Library of Congress? <laughs> yes. And I, this, 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 okay. I was afraid this, this would come up. Um, <laughs> um, yes. Uh, if you, the Library of Congress shows that virtually every book on Mormonism and the Mormons was checked out to the White House in 1841 for about eight months or so, you know, at, and, you know, Lincoln's name's there, whether he signed it or one of his secretaries signed it. And so it's clear that uh, there was all of the all of the books about the Mormons went to the White House. And, you know, unfortunately for for Latter-day Saints, almost all of the books were anti-Mormon books, as, as most <laughs> as most books at that time were. But the book, the but Book of Mormon was one of them. And at that time, you know, Lincoln had two two problem two political problems having to do with with Utah. One was the the governor, the territorial governor. Uh, they'd had a string of really poor appointees, and Lincoln had added to the mess with a guy named Stephen Harding, and uh, the delegates from the territory of Utah, you know, who who were Latter Day Saints, were were pressing Lincoln to you know, appoint somebody else. So there was that going on. And also uh, Brigham Young and, and, and the saints were petitioning Congress to be admitted as a state. You know, here, here you had all of these Southern states trying to get out of the union and, and, and the Latter-day Saints are trying to get into the union. Uh, of course, Congress didn't accept it, but, but th those, are, those are the problems that the Lincoln administration faced. So it made a lot of sense for people in, in the White House, uh, whether it be one of his secretaries or other people, to be looking into the question. Now, I, I, I suspect, uh, well, I don't know, I, I guess I shouldn't read into the question, but let, 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 let me share this. Um, for all of the years I worked at the Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum, you know, we were always asked questions about was did Lincoln get baptized a Baptist? Did, was he baptized a Catholic? Uh, obvious, the Methodist Baptist, every, all the Christian denominations wanted to claim, you know, Lincoln is their own. And, and I, I was always able to, to turn to my colleagues and say, you know, well, the Latter-day Saints revere Abraham Lincoln, but, but, but you know, we, we don't claim, you know, that, that Lincoln ever converted to Mormonism or ever believed it. But, you know, we, we believe we believe he was a, a divine instrument, but it wasn't necessarily conscious, you know, of Mormon doctrine or anything like that. Well, uh, a few years ago, so, uh, some Latter-day Saint writers have picked up on this idea of the Book of Mormon being uh, checked out to the White House. And so they've alleged that Lincoln had a close reading of the Book of Mormon that inspired his understanding of the Civil War and influenced his views on emancipation. There's just no evidence for that. Uh, uh, they're, they're really overreaching the evidence and they're giving more interpretive weight to fragmentary ambiguous sources, often hearsay, than those sources can bear. Um, but you, you know, this, this desire to 
align Lincoln with your faith tradition is certainly not unique to Latter-day Saints. Latter-day Saints are latecomers to the game because virtually every other Christian denomination has already claimed him. Uh, but, uh, but, but that book that came out uh, has, has stirred some interest in, in Latter-day Saint circles uh, from my perspective, unfortunately, because there's just really no conclusive or, or uh, you know, solid evidence that if, if Lincoln ever did read the Book of Mormon or look at it, it would have been in the 1840s uh, dur during the, all of the, the, the Mormon troubles out in Nauvoo. And uh, it, there's just absolutely nothing in the Lincoln record that would indicate that anything he read from the Book of Mormon uh, influenced his thoughts. So I, I'm, a, I'm a Debbie Downer, you know, to, to <laughs> some, some of my, uh, some people, but, you know, as a story and just calling things as they are. Um, yeah. Link, Lincoln's reading of the Book of Mormon did not influence his uh, interpretation or actions in the Civil War. Okay, well... Our next question, you actually sort of answered, but you didn't quite. But you were, I thought you were going to answer it without even knowing it, Brian. The <laughs> next question was, did Lincoln have a religious denomination preference during his time in Springfield? And I think you kind of touched on it, but can you, did he have a, did he have a de religious denomination preference? Well, his wife certainly did. I mean, she, she was first an Episcopalian, but when, when they were in Springfield, when Eddie died, their second son, uh, the, 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 the minister for the Presbyterian Church was, was very helpful to them, and, and Mary joined, and Lincoln paid for a, a pew, and he attended the, the First Presbyterian Church there in Springfield from time to time uh, in his Illinois years, and became a good friend uh, with the minister there, and, and appointed him to... Uh, he, some kind some kind of I'd have to go back and look at this some some kind of emissary to Scotland or or somewhere in North England during during the Civil War. That's in my other book, Lincoln Lincoln Springfield. Okay, so Okay. But Lincoln himself uh he never joined a church despite everybody claiming they baptized him, there's no evidence <laughs> that he was. So Okay. Um all right, so here's our next question. After Lincoln died or passed away, what was the response of the Mormons? Or did they even have a response? No, they they they, they had a response, and and there was uh, there there was sorrow. Uh, you know, Brigham Young was never a great fan of Lincoln, but he respected him and appreciated him, and realized that Lincoln uh, was, was the best of all the the bad uh, possibilities in the in the Republican Party. <laughs> So, you know, it was it was not good for the Latter-day Saints to lose Abraham Lincoln, but also just on, on an emotional, you know, the Latter-day Saints, most of them were, were Northerners and they were loyal to the Union. That's where their families had come from. And uh, they and they genuinely hated to see uh, the president assassinated. There were some exceptions, you know, there just as uh, places in, in the north, there were exceptions. People cheered when Lincoln was killed. But as a general rule, most of the Latter-day Saints uh, felt bad about it. Okay. All right. Here's our next question. Were the Mormons in favor of emancipation? <sighs> that would be individual by individual. Uh, as, a, as a general rule, yes. Uh, there, there, were, there were issues when, when Utah was a territory in the early 1850s on how to deal with slavery in the territory. And unfortunately, uh, in 1852-53, uh, it, it was allowed. And it was not widespread. And there was big debate in, in the territorial legislature. But it was allowed. Uh, in the territory, and of course, that all ended with the Civil War, and and almost all of the saints uh, were were anti-slavery and and accepted emancipation and thought it was the right thing. Okay, we're asking you some tough questions tonight, right? <laughs> these, are, <laughs> these are these are not these are not uh, 
These are not equations. Okay. So um, next question. So of all of the stories in Lincoln and Mormon country, do you have a favorite and why? Uh, that, that's not fair, is it? <laughs> I said these are hard questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, let, let me share one story that that was maybe maybe the one of the hardest to, to dig out. And that's on, on the part of the book. Let, let me open it, it. It's on the the route that Joseph Smith would have followed between Nauvoo and Springfield, going to and from his extradition trial in the winter time of 1842-43, and it was a four-day journey and was staying three nights. And the the the, the last night before getting to Springfield, uh, he stayed between uh, Ashland and Philadelphia. Uh, out in, uh, you know, between uh, Beardstown and Springfield at uh, Captain Dutch's halfway house and, and trying to figure out where that was, this uh, this paper town, Lancaster, that had been laid out and trying to figure out where that was and uh, why it had disappeared. Uh, that that took some digging and some looking and, and walking around fields out there along the road between Beardstown and, and Springfield. And that, that, that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun to do. Um, so, so that's one that comes to mind. I think the other thing that I really enjoyed in this looking for Lincoln uh, in, in Mormon country book was getting into Abraham Lincoln's family in Hancock County, the other Abraham Lincoln. You know, Lincoln's first cousin, who was named Abraham, and he and he lived in Fountain Green, uh, which was uh, east of Nauvoo, and they were contemporaries of the Mormons. Uh, Lincoln's uncle Mordecai, uh, if you know your Lincoln stories, it's uncle Mordecai that shot the Indian that saved Lincoln's father's life when the Indians in Kentucky killed Lincoln's grandfather. Well, uncle Mordecai uh, moved his family up to Illinois the winter of the great snows, you know, in time for that in 1830. And he froze to death in a blizzard uh, just just outside his farm. And he got lost, disoriented. Some say he got drunk and, and they found his body frozen, you know, later. And he had three sons, James and Mordecai Jr. and, and Abraham. And so Lincoln had three first cousins living on the west, the, the east side of Hancock County. And yeah, he maybe he visited them sometime, but we just don't have it documented. The only time we know for sure is that when when Lincoln was there uh, campaigning in 1858, and his cousin Abraham, the other Abraham Lincoln, had died in 1852. But his his son, Lincoln's first cousin once removed, Robert Lincoln, was running for sheriff on the Republican ticket with Lincoln running for president on the Republican ticket in 1860 in, in Hancock County. It, isn't it interesting that Springfield's Abraham Lincoln named his son Robert and Hancock County's Abraham Lincoln named his son Robert. So we've got two Abrahams and two Robert Lincolns. You can see how confusing Oh my is. word. But so Abraham and, and, and the Hancock County Robert ran on the same Hancock County ticket in 1860 as Republicans and they both lost. But, but just studying that and then I, I got to take Nikki Stratton, who was uh, one of the founders of, of Looking for Lincoln, and I took her out across these cornfields out in the middle of nowhere to this Catholic cemetery that's out in the cornfield. You, you've got to know where to find it. You can't just see it easily to take her to the grave of the other Abraham Lincoln out there. And uh, So I've got that in the book, but that, that was a lot of fun. So anyway. Okay. I'll, I'll shut up. I, I could tell something fun about each story. So, well, I just I think it's I think it's good to hear from the author. You know what what you think is very interesting in the book. Um, all right, here's our next question: Were subsequent presidents, so after Lincoln, more or less sympathetic toward the Mormons in Utah? No, no, not at all. Um, so they were not that the Republican Party. You know, a, after. The Republican Party was in power, and the Republican Party, once slavery was out of the way, they went after polygamy in Utah as the the twin 
relic of barbarism to, to slavery. And presidents like James Garfield and others ran on anti-Mormon tickets. And they, the Republican Party sponsored a, a, a concentrated um, political campaign, legislative campaign to do away with polygamy and to basically disincorporate the Latter-day Saint Church and, and force their theocracy, their, their, their control of the local government out. Uh, and that all came to a head uh, in, in the 1880s. And uh, you know, so finally the, the, the Mormons relented. Uh, they gave up polygamy so that they could keep what was most important, which was their temples, where the, the highest rituals and, and, and ceremonies of the faith are performed, where sealings for eternal marriage and, and baptisms for the dead and, and all of these highest things in Mormon theology are done, uh, they, 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 they had to give up polygamy in order to keep the temples to do those things. And so, no, that uh, until the end of the century, there weren't very many sympathetic presidents. The, the first Democrat to come in, Grover Cleveland, was a little bit more sympathetic um, than the Republicans. That When you finally get to Theodore Roosevelt at the turn of the century, um, he he, became, he was more sympathetic, um, and then from that point forward, you know, the, especially after World War II, uh, Latter Day Saints were more accepted into the common mainstream uh, in American culture, and and there hasn't been that kind of tension or friction that that was the case in the late 1800s. Okay, thank you. All right, here's our next question. This one has a little bit of context before I ask the question. Um, it says that William Herndon said that Lincoln was an atheist when he was a younger man, but by the time of his second inaugural, Lincoln is appealing to deity quite frequently. So this is the question. Do you think Lincoln's religious views evolved over the course of the Civil War, or was he merely invoking civil religion in later speeches? We'll never know the answer to that question conclusively. Uh, I, I I think that there was uh, a, a, a maturation or an evolution of Lincoln's willingness to accept a kind of spiritual or or a, a kind of providential dimension to our human experience. Uh, I think that crystallized in the war. And, you know, think think of the guilt that he would have if he had just signed his name on a piece of paper. Uh, causing a ceasefire, all the all the killing would have stopped, and nobody would have died anymore, and 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 people were telling him that, and that's a pretty heavy psychological emotional burden to carry. Um, so, you know, he, he's thinking that, and and also he he still got this kind of fatalism, this kind of idea of fate or predestination from from his parents' hard shell Baptist background. And I think this all came together as, as, as the war went on. And I think he found, I think he found solace in, in the idea that, that there was a providence beyond all of this, that it wasn't just his doing, it wasn't just his fault. And, and I think his second inaugural address, I, I think it reflects something more than just a kind of cynical playing to American religious uh, proclivities for political purposes. I, I think I think he was uh, more deeply thinking like that. So I uh, I think there was a, a religious dimension. I, I I don't think that Lincoln was ever to, able to cross the hurdle and become a conventional Christian. I, I think he was probably a a, a, a a 19th century Victorian closet doubter. I think he struggled and, and wanted to believe. He wanted to get the comfort. He admired and, and respected people that had that, but he himself couldn't quite get there and, and probably felt some kind of lack or longing that he could. But the, these are all of my speculations. There's nothing in the historical record that I think we can conclusively say. Okay.
Okay. Thanks, Brian. All right. I have one last question as we wrap up. And we frequently ask this question. So, um, and given your background with both Lincoln history, um, this is why I feel very comfortable asking this question. <laughs> why do you think, I know this is, this is deviating from the topic, but in the 21st century, why do you think it is important to continue to look at the life of Lincoln or study the life of Lincoln? Uh, I link, I think Lincoln's life and story is the great promise uh, of American democracy and the American system. And we, we, we need that kind of assurance or that kind of pie in the sky standard to, to continue to aspire to. Um, you know, Lincoln, there's a lot of, there's a lot of debate about American exceptionalism and, and it's kind of out of vogue or, or looked down on now to think that America is an exceptional country. And, and Lincoln was very careful about that too. You know, he, he tried to warn people in the second inaugural address, you know, we're not, we're not special. We're all at fault. You can't, you can't claim God, you know, one side or the other. We all suffered because of this and we're all equally guilty uh, because of slavery and things. But I think there was a sense in which Lincoln thought America was exceptional. You know, when, when he was growing up, you'd look around the world and there's nowhere else other than America in the Jacksonian period uh, in the 1820s, 30s and 40s, where a people where a person like him could aspire to become to achieve the highest political and social level in his, in his country. Not England, not anywhere in Europe, nowhere else in the world would that have been possible in his mind, I think. Uh, so that was important to Lincoln. And times have changed, you know, that, that uh, the, the American dream becomes harder and harder to envision as times have changed. But I think there's still something very American that resonates there. And, and that's important for us to, to, to keep as a possibility. You know, Lincoln said uh, in terms of the, the uh, Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. And he said, obviously that hasn't happened, but that's an aspiration that we need, need to keep going after. And, and I think we should hold up Lincoln's story uh, as that same same thing in the 21st century. It may be, seem unrealistic, but it's aspirational, and it, it's important that we keep those that out there, so that we keep trying and that we don't just give up. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Brian. I have really appreciated. I know our audience has really enjoyed um, interacting with you and asking questions. Thank you. There's been lots of comments in the chat about you doing an exceptionally good job. Through. Thank you so much. And with that, everyone, we will say good night. Have a great rest of your evening.